how's it going, guys? Welcome to Audio Addiction. We have a special guest with us, and he can say his name and what he does in the band. Hey, I'm Greg Rikus, and I'm a folk punk artist from Winnipeg, Manitoba. There we go. Well, Greg, thank you for joining me. I want to always give a shout out to my lovely friend from across the pond, Val. She always sends me some really incredible artists. So thank you again, Val. Much love to you. But Greg, I wanted to know we had a little bit of a moment to chat because I always love doing that. Um, but I wanted to know what is kind of the origin story of, of Greg? What made you get into music? Because obviously you're a solo artist and this is very much... I'd argue a solo endeavor for you, but what kind of got your toes in the water and what made you want to start being a musician? Did you come from like a musical family? Give me, give me the origin story of Greg here. Yeah. Oh man. How long do we have? Uh, take all the time you want. <laughs> <laughs> I just do I'll this for try fun, to you know? keep it somewhat realistic. So nobody in my family, family was musical at all. My, wow. my mom would try to play the piano and she was a teacher so she was up at like 6 a.m. and she'd hit like four notes like dun 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 and then you could just like feel her like looking at the staff and trying to figure out like this <laughs> next note what note is that and then she'd start again dun 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 and then so definitely didn't come from the mum's side and my dad actually used to own a, a bar and a hotel in Selkirk, Manitoba. Ah, okay. So if I mean Manitoba is already, you know, Winnipeg is already small. Selkirk was about 30 minutes north, this little community. And he had a bunch of bands coming there. And, and that's actually where, where I was born. I mean, oh. I was born at the hospital, but like they brought me home to the, the born hotel at a show, you know, <laughs> where we lived until they finally decided, okay, we have a, a son now, I guess we better get a house, but. So I guess I've been exposed to live music kind of my entire life, but in terms of a passion for it, it didn't really develop till my teen years. Mm. And I, you know, I was always kind of into music, but in the eighties, it was like hair metal, you know, or like Bon Jovi kind of stuff. I was just a little kid. Yeah. The nineties hit, I was kind of into dance music and then nirvana kind of happened so i got really into that of course and then from there it kind of gave me you know the next rock to jump to was green day Ooh. and i was like man this is like nirvana but fun <laughs> you know, all the songs aren't about like killing yourself no no offense like kurt cobain you know much sure. respect, yeah, love, yeah, yeah. love the dude's legacy that he has left however green day was a bit more like we're partying we're head bobbing yeah yeah, yeah. And that kind of, you know, the gateway drug into bands like The Offspring and No Effects and then Winnipeg's hometown heroes, Propagandi. And, you know, from there and there, you kind of learn about this band that leads to another band that leads to another band that leads to this compilation CD that your friend loans you. Now, you know, like 50 more bands. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, the punk scene, even though it was underground, it was just so accessible and uh, Music City was kind of a cool record store downtown Winnipeg. They had this little punk section. Oh, sick. The dude, Andy, that worked there always made sure, you know, was well-stocked with, like, bands you never heard of that were super cool. So by the time I was about 17, it was like, this is done. This is what I'm going to do. And to, like, you know, the, the disappointment of my parents at the time, I, like, catapulted myself into music. And I, I started organizing punk shows in Winnipeg. I, oh, sick. My band was playing, like, every week. But I was, you know, I have a tiny little bit of brains in the head because I realized I'm not going to make a living putting on punk shows because you always just give all the money to the bands. But <laughs> I'm also not going to make a living playing in a punk band because, you know, like, the 20 people that come to see my band, half of them got in for free, first of all. And <laughs> Oof, yeah. So I, I started learning how to plug in microphones and I, I went, uh, took a course at a local um, uh, media arts school Okay. and I started mixing at bars and that's how I, kind of how I launched my audio career and kind of my music and audio career kind of went hand in hand. Yeah. And, you know, as I kind of increased skills in there, I was touring more, learning more about kind of how to book the tour, how the band works. My first real band was called High Five Drive, and we just mowed the lawn relentlessly across Canada like this, coast to coast to coast. And we, I mean, we did okay. Early 90s, we kind of caught the tail end of like the skate punk thing. Mm, but the okay. emo thing was starting to really blow up. And, and you know, we just kind of got outpaced by all these new bands that had a cooler, better look and tighter jeans and nicer, nicer butts. And <laughs> there was no competing with that. 
you know, where we, we came and every kid was like super to no effects. And then the next time we came through, everyone was like taking back Sundays, the best yeah. thing that ever happened. <laughs> so, so as the band kind of came to a close in 2010, we, we did have a very, very fortunate run in Europe where we did four different tours in Europe and, you know, a couple smaller labels put out a few of the records. Like it was oh, the band is something I never regret. High five drive was some of the best times of my life. As I came to a close, I knew I wanted to do something solo. I knew I wanted to do something by myself, but I'm like, well, DJ, no way I'm going to be a DJ. I mean, d- despite like me not hating the shit out of dance music, it's still like <laughs> not my thing. Um, Fair, yeah. Acoustic stuff. Okay. But I don't want to be the like, you know, add yet another person to the pile of dudes that like, I used to play in a punk band. I grew a beard. I combed my hair nice. Yeah, and beanie, now I'm like yeah. a singer songwriter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just kind of, that's not how I'm going to go out with that on my shield. Sure, so yeah. I I saw this band play at a folk festival uh, called Hoots in Hellmouth. Hmm. And they had these wooden platforms of tambourines and like several of them were like stomping on as they play. And they were just like, <laughs> you know, just playing this thing like like Kingdom Come. And, and so seeing that, it kind of inspired me to like, you know, I think... I think that's within arm's reach of I want what I want to do. So I got my roommate at the time to build this giant platform, which the plan was to put a mic under it, put tambourines all over it. And then when I play, I stomp. Wow. Okay. And that's kind of the, the Genesis in 2010 when the solo thing started. So I started writing songs, uh, ended up doing a record in 2011 and just hit the road of like, this is a touring act and was determined to do at least 150 shows a year. And about every three years, I do a record. So that's kind of a little less touring. I It's got to come from somewhere. So I work a lot more on a record year. But basically, I've maintained that for more than a decade. Uh, thank you. The second record, I knew I wanted to do kind of like a band thing on record. I would still tour solo. You know, unfortunately, it's just not really feasible at my level to bring a band, nor do I think a lot more people would come see it if it was the band i mean maybe a few more but you know until the mechanism if ever there's a song that goes kabang or whatever of course like the band is on deck i would love for them to come on the road and be able to pay them and blah 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 but for now touring is going to be a solo act but i really liked being a band on record so punkoustic being my my second record Mm. that's when that kind of thing started and then the third record um sibling cities that was kind of the drummer that was with me for for quite a while. He played on that new bass player. Fourth record, Death and Taxes, same drummer, but we had a different bass player. Uh-huh. And that's when my friend Daryl, who is a awesome sax player and can can sing and just talented musician, uh, he had played one song on Punkoustic. He played one song on Sibling Cities. Like, why don't you just join the band? So. <laughs> So he jumped in and it was a little bit polarizing. I, I had a few friends that were like, you know, honest, we're not that into sax and it's like on every single song. And, but the vast majority of people were like, that's cool. Like you, you know, trying to do something different, kind of more of a folk punk approach, not just the standard, like guitar based drums guy yelling. Like I thought it kind of to, to be something different, to be like, I love what, you know, not, to generalize everyone i love what everyone does i always want to be slightly different yeah sure. and then the latest record um uh sinners go to church saint go to jail uh, i think he really came into his own i think da- daryl really stepped it up on sax a lot and just maybe you know made it happen kind of thing and mm-hmm. um bass player blue they are another amazing musician they have a, a project called grotoco in winnipeg which uh, they actually came on the road with me once. We did a tour oh, together. And uh, the bass player previous, I had to move to Ottawa for work reasons. Blue was the first one on the list. And, and you know, right away was like, yes, of course I want to do it. And then Shay played in a bunch of local bands on, he has kind of a different style. Eric, the for a while, is like a human metronome and like wonderful drummer, love playing. And Shay was a bit more of a punk drummer, like his, you know, right hand wrist is just amazing. Those yeah. 16ths the whole time, he brought a different flavor. So I feel this record is like, although it's not totally different from what I've always done, it stands out, I think. And I think the songs really came together. I'm we're really, really happy. And, you know, that doesn't always happen. Sibling Cities, although some people have said my, my third record said they loved it. I always thought 
you know, it was a bit weak on my vocals. I just didn't mm. really deliver on the vocals. Some of the songs, meh, love them or leave them kind of thing. You know, you're never necessarily 100% happy. Sure. But I'd say like mid to high 90s in terms of percentages of happiness for this last record. But, but anyways, there's the story of me. That's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. Well, kudos for you to keep going because I feel like as myself, I always – it is always curious to me doing this for eight years. I feel like that's an eternity. And I like wa like every year on the 16th, which is like when I started uploading onto YouTube, I go back and I'll watch my first interview to be like, wow, I really sucked at this. But now I'm like, I'm mildly better at doing it after eight years, you know? So like, I feel like it's like, I would imagine similarly to you, like you obviously love all of your past records, but I feel like you always kind of look forward to the next one so you can continue to elevate, continue to improve what you already know how to do and like just maybe get the formula down a little bit stronger or like the songwriting could be better or maybe like the band's tighter or something like that. And as for me, you know, obviously prior to this, I wasn't really familiar with your work, but I went and listened to Sinners Go to Church, Saints Go to Jail, and I got about three quarters, a third of the way through the album. Um, and I was like, man, this isn't, so and this is what I told Greg, is like, this isn't something I would typically listen to, but I always try to go into a lot of the artists I have on with like an open mind. Obviously, some are a little bit more closer to my wheelhouse, what I know. Um, but I felt like with this, I was like, there's this kind of like, folksy sort of styling to it but then there's like this underlying punk punk element which i was like trying to figure out like through a majority of the songs i was like i was like this has like a, more of a punk feel to it and obviously not knowing your background i was like this is cool i like this um and then i love like the saxophone i'm a huge horns fan i love when any group awesome. or artist incorporates some sort of horn element into it um, and I was like, man, he's kind of incorporating like a little bit of like ska elements, which I was like, I don't know if he's necessarily directly, you know, listen to a lot of ska music, but I was like, it kind of gives me that like street light manifesto kind of feel to it, which is really, you know, again, they kind of borderline that ska punk, like folksy sort of stuff. So I was like, this is really cool. But I also love the element that you write the music with a band, but, you know, sometimes it's not always you know, the best opportunity to take a band out. And I, I kind of assimilate it similarly to another Canadian legend band, uh, you know, City in Color. I feel like oh, yeah, know, yeah. he does like a lot of like acoustic stuff or just like him or like a duo. And I feel like that's kind of the sim, I would argue, a similar mentality of like, oh, we can do the band stuff. If I can bring the band out on tour, I'm going to try to do it. And then, you know, I, but if not, then I'm going to just bring my acoustic guitar and just play and do my thing. Um, so I, I love that. And I appreciate all the detail because, like, you know, kudos for, again, continuing to do it for 25 years. I hope I could be so graceful and do it for do this for 25 years, you know, but um, is there any advice you would have? Like, is there anything that you would tell yourself if you were starting a band now? Do you have any advice for, like, people that are, like, making music now or like early on and they're like man i need some good advice do you have anything that you wish you knew sooner oh tons yeah yeah <laughs> like, I could, I, again like how much time do i have um i think one of the smart things i did when i was telling kind of the greg Rikus origin story uh, i got into audio really easily i kind of found a career that i didn't hate and it worked really really hard to be a good audio person and it doesn't mean like whatever you do you don't have to necessarily like copy and paste exactly what i did but the best thing about audio is it's feast or famine in winnipeg either it's summertime and we're doing a festival every weekend there's so much work like it's unbelievable how busy it is or like the springtime the season we're going into is very very slow fall time also it's it's been picking up like the times i stay home in fall to do a new record i've found there's no shortage of work but I try to tour around the slow times, and then when it's busy, I'm home to work. Sure. So that way, you could still kind of maintain an income. You have, you know, a number to work with when it comes time to fix the van, buy a new van, record a record. You know, the piece of gear that blow, blew up while you were playing a show that is detrimental to you playing another show. Yeah. You know, it is expensive to be on the road all the time. And I do it cheap, cheap, cheap. I 
you know, I'm over 40 and I still sleep in my van most nights or, you know, wow. when I'm in Europe, I just go on the bus and the train. I have this big cart that has like, you know, my pedal board and my luggage, some records, some t-shirts, and then I have a guitar in the other hand and wow. I just jump on the Flix bus and on the Eurostar and, and that's how I get to all the shows. So it is, it is as cheap as you could possibly do it. I'm still, you know, barely making money at best. And a lot of tours, you end up losing a little bit. So I think if you're going to go into it, make sure that the expectation of making money is, is kind of like, you know, almost like gambling. We're like, yeah, if I'm going to go throw a dollar in a slot machine, hopefully I can afford to lose that dollar. Like I'm not counting on it being sure, a win. Yeah. And similar with touring, if you're going to invest money in, you know, to try to develop your act, to take it on the road, don't expect it to be a paycheck right away or potentially at all. And I think that's another reason why I've been able to do it so long. I think a lot of people get stuck where they start to just take on a lot of debt, or maybe they're very ambitious at the start and they hire the expensive publicist. They have, you know, they rent the van, they have a guy coming with them to do their tech stuff and they get a hotel every night. Next thing you know, they come back from a couple tours and they're like a hundred grand in the hole and there's no possible way they can pay it. That's so crazy. I think like keep, keeping it small, keeping it manageable, not spending money you don't have, don't go into debt unless you absolutely have to um, uh, talk to other people. Oh, they do it. I'm not the only success story. There's a lot of people that have found other ways to make the funding work that have you know, other ways to tour to get their music out there. Maybe if you never leave your house, but you have a really clever way to do it online, you know, that's enough for you. For me, the traveling is such a big part of it. Sure. Seeing the friends is also such a big part of it. I couldn't imagine kind of just staying home and playing music, you know, on the internet. Yeah, and, sure. And yeah. That, that being enough, but, but yeah, the, I got lucky with the audio thing. I'm sure there's other jobs that have feast or famine. I know some people, somehow make it work working on the road. And by that, I mean, they have like somewhat of a job that can be done remotely. Mm. For me, often I'll wake up whatever in the morning I have to drive to kind of get to where I'm, or I'm going. I usually have at least two to four hours of work on the tour. For, you know, either I'm booking shows, confirming stuff, booking the next tour, whatever it is to try to find another, you know, four to eight hours a day to work on your job. I, I don't think it can be done, but. But whatever. And also, I think the bottom line, too, is keep it fun. Not yeah. everyone has to be on the road for seven months of the year. Like, I've I've set up my life over the last 25 years to do this. My life kind of revolves around touring, and I love it. Uh, the stakes for me going on tour are not very high. Of course, I miss my partner. I miss my friends. But, you know, I have a bunch of other friends I get to see on tour. I have a lot yeah. of stuff I love. And I've talked to a lot of artists that being on the road, they just hate the shit out of it. Like they got a shower every day. That's very important to them. They have to sleep in a comfortable bed every night. They have to, you know, have time to like, after their show, they just want to be on the phone for 20 minutes and <laughs> whatever. They're human. People are humans, but yeah, you know, after you get off the stage, that is the crucial amount of time to like talk to everyone to go, you know, to the merch table, try to sell the t-shirts, try to this, try to that. Like the job doesn't start when you hit the stage and end when you're off. The job is all day long. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes sleeping, pardon me? It's a constant. Exactly. Sometimes sleeping in the van is because I'm just tired and I don't want to, I don't want to talk to someone anymore. But, you know, you go to stay to someone's house, like, well, first of all, I appreciate the hospitality. I want to get to know them. But sometimes they're like, oh, I've heard you tour Europe. I want to do that. Can you tell me about it? Or just like, oh, let's hear some war stories. Tell me about, you know, when you were in the band and yeah. touring in Ukraine or or whatever. Like some of the more interesting things I've did, they want to hear about it. And I'm sure people would understand if I'm like, you know, yo, I'm really tired, man. I just want to go to yeah. bed. Like people aren't going to hate the shit out of me at the same time. Like to make a connection with someone, to make friends to where next time you come through, they they want to help you. And not only that, that's the fun part of touring is all the friends you get to make. Oh yeah. So I, I guess in, you know, it's not for everyone. There's a million ways to do it, but I think key points is get your career down. Don't just work at McDonald's or, you know, some shitty call center or whatever lousy yeah. job you end up with when you're not touring to try to fund it, find something that's like a real job that'll help so much. And then be ready for kind of, if you're going to be on the road, like it's, it's a lot of work. It's not necessarily a holiday, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
And, you know, if it's something you want to do, like I've somehow carved a career out for 25 years, I hope I can do another 25. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it is just realistic expectations and enjoying no matter who's in the audience that, hey, this one person that showed up, I get to play for them or the back of those two people's heads. That's my challenge tonight. I'm going to try to turn one of those heads around. Sure, yeah. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. But, you know, it's a Monday and I'm in like Louisville, Kentucky. You know, let's go. Let's see what happens. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, wins, wins, losses. It's still it's just another night on tour, man. And it's still the greatest thing I ever did. And I feel very lucky I get to do it. Yeah, I hope everyone does. No, I think that's great advice. You know, like I've I've had the fortune to have homies of mine stay on like and shout outs to my parents. They used to like house. I used to like pester them and be like, hey, this band's coming through. Is it OK if like they stay over our house? And they're always like really cool with it. And I, I think if anything, they have like more respect now for like people who do touring music, you know, who are touring musicians, you know, because like I don't think it's like something that they really understood, but like knew that I was so like gung ho about it where I was like, they don't I mean, they're going to spend X amount of dollars to like stay in a hotel or they're just going to sleep in their van. Most likely, like you might as well just give them like a shower and like place to wash their clothes and like company if they want to like hang out you know stuff like that and I yeah think that it's means so a lot. appreciated yeah i think it means a lot like regardless of if they say it or not like i think it's really appreciative to have like somebody that like gives a shit about what you do and like obviously wants you to do well and like i, I think that's a really crucial thing so if you can house bands like absolutely do it. i think it's uh it's it's definitely made my life a lot better like i i think i've made like a lot of some of my closest friends just by having them stay at our house like you know it, it was such a cool thing so big salutes to my parents for doing that and hopefully uh if you come through greg you're more than welcome to come come chill oh, out thanks, my apartment. <laughs> i guarantee i'll take you up on that at some point there we <laughs> if go. not this spring sometime soon <laughs> we'll find out we'll find out but i appreciate the advice as well uh i think it's always good to get people's perspective that have been doing it for a while i think it's like you know i think people ask me about doing youtube so i feel like as being a musician doing it you know to pretty good success i think that's uh i think that's you know more kudos to you to you know obviously touring internationally being able to tour the states as well as like canada i think that's a, a big accomplishment so should definitely be proud of continuing Thank to do you. that obviously so i appreciate that i think another thing i should have mentioned is consistency which has worked for me mm. uh, you know I, I always tour kind of the same times of the year around my schedule so that when you're lining up work you know like i literally just finished last night this big festival called festival du voyageur and it's a french cultural festival mm. i've been involved in it for years it's great. It's guaranteed work in, in February and it works well right between kind of a January tour I do on the West Coast and then this springtime thing to go to Europe. People also start to expect you to come back and like, oh, yeah, no, Greg always comes through this time. We'll give him give him a show, make sure he's OK. You know, I feel one year if I didn't send out the emails, like I'm going to get a whole bunch of messages in the yeah, like, What happened to Greg? Like, <laughs> you okay, man? Are you, you coming or what's where Are you, you right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Third of May, you come every year. So I think that's been a big thing too. And, you know, I think it'd, it'd be different again if I ever, one of the songs off this new record or if I wrote a song in the future that really took off and maybe now there's kind of a demand everywhere for me, then it's more of a demand of like, okay, this festival, that festival, and you kind of book around that sure, or something. Yeah. Right now for me, my touring schedule is great. It really works for my work schedule for me to be able to kind of maintain. And, you know, even if I, I can't necessarily play for free, but even if I'm playing for very little, my job can kind of take care of the rest and, you know, can kind of keep the van running and keep the wheels turning. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's um, and consistency as well, obviously, and doing content as well is like huge. So obviously, you know, best of luck. I know you're going to be going out on a tour soon. So, you know, be sending the positive aura to you, but <laughs> I wanted to know, Greg, since, you know, obviously you're new to the channel and people may or may not have heard of you, uh, what song would you recommend to a new listener to check out first to kind of give them an idea of, you know, what you do in your sound and stuff like that? I think off the new record, Wretched of the Earth is a great starting point. I think it's it's the one where Blue uh, didn't, I, I knew they're like multi-instrumentalists, didn't realize they also played the accordion. 
So that's that's, so that's who plays the accordion yeah. on that one. They even uh, did it at the CD release. It was awesome. A friend jumped up to take over the bass and whipped that's up so the accordion. <laughs> but, but I also think it's kind of our showing off song as the band. Like it's it's one of the best on the record. I think it really, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It really demonstrates my vocal style. Now I've kind of a deeper voice and I've really leaned into that the last couple of records, trying to really embrace kind of my rich to- timber or timbre in my voice. Um, on top of that, it has a yelly part to show like, if I want to be loud, I can still be loud. Um, but not only that one, I think um, um, maybe Encampment Ooh, is the yeah. second track. So track three and then track two, you got to go backwards. <laughs> That's one I've gotten a lot of compliments on. I wasn't really expecting it. I thought it was an okay song, but to be honest, like if for some reason we had to cut one or two on the record, that was on the chopping block. Wow. And then everyone's kind of leaned into it. But I do got to confess the lyrics on that one. I think I've kind of exceeded expectation. It was one of my better ones where it's kind of clever. It's kind of poetic at the same time. And uh, my partner, Katie, always points out that, like, you never put your lyrics anywhere. So before anyone <laughs> emails me, they are going to be on Bandcamp before I leave for this tour. I've been busy as as hell for oh, the I'm last sure. how many yeah. months, just, you know, nonstop. But this week, I have made time to take care of some stuff. Finally going to post my lyrics for Death and Taxes, my previous album, and this one on Bandcamp. Wow. All yeah, right. I don't, Death and Taxes, I might have done it. I don't think I did. So if People do want to read what the heck I'm trying to say, but I don't know. Did you have a, a, a tough time understanding the lyrics? I, don't, I, I mean, I'm to me, I, well, you're asking the completely wrong person because I am more of the music first, then delve into the lyrics later. Right. I think it has a lot to do with because like the way that I learned how to make music and stuff like that was a lot by ear. So I tend to focus more on the musicality of it. And then I'm like, if I like it, then I will delve more into the lyricism which mm. I don't know if that's common or uncommon. You guys can let me know in the comments. Oh, I've been told that so many times. I'm, yeah. I'm, I am I'm, I feel like I'm a music music connoisseur first, and then I delve more into the lyr- lyricism afterwards, and then I think that's when I get more, obviously more out of it, more appreciation for it. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I think the, so the songs that I listened to, Greg, were Follow the Sound, uh, encampment, uh, wretched of the earth and rift was the last one I oh, ended nice. on. So, um, yeah. I would say out of the four, those four that I listened to, I think encampment was actually my favorite of the four. So I was surprised to say that that wouldn't would be the chopping block one. Cause I enjoyed that one a lot. So I was uh, surprised. That's interesting. Yeah, it was, if anybody, anyone listening is like not a songwriter and always wondering, like, first of all, yes, I do listen to my own music. Not a lot. I'm not like a psycho. <laughs> At the same time, like to throw in the record, you know, I, I love yeah, doing you stuff to do with older records. Yeah. Like before I'm going to write a record, I'll kind of go through my whole collection, just have like, where did I leave off? What, you know, what, what have people heard? Um, and also like, we have no sense of what songs are good or not. Like, you know, some of the stuff I think is my best work. Someone's like, that's your favorite song. And <laughs> just so often I'd like this exact situation where I'm like, that one almost didn't make the record. And it's like number one, like the most listened to song of the whole record. Yeah. So. That's, I think it's interesting how people, I think it's like the joke of like your, your heart's just critic. I feel like some people tend to lean a little bit more into it than not, you know, it's, I always find it really interesting and, I think that's often why I like to pick people's brains about why they feel like this is their, they're like, ah, I don't know about this song, but everyone else that like listens to your music is like, nah, that's your great. Come on. That's your best. That's you the know best, best one. Yeah. Are you Come crazy? On, man. Yeah, What's wrong with you, man? Like, you know, but I think it's so funny because it's like, because people are like, wait, Greg wrote it. And Greg doesn't think this is a great song. This is like, this, what type of like, you know, what type of twilight zone are we in? where you know he's like oh this is the i don't think this is my best work and clearly the masses feel that way but i don't know you'll have to find out go check out greg's stuff all the links will be below of course go show him some love but i but yeah i'm excited to get into i think i'm about a a third of the way through i'd argue roughly so uh, yeah actually i think exactly because there's 12 songs but nice okay yeah i think i think it kind of hits hard at the start and i think it kind of takes you to places uh, towards the end, the last song was actually something I wrote around 2010-ish. It was going to be for wow. my band, How Fall Drive. And it just wasn't coming together with the band, so it kind of got shelved. And honestly, I don't think I really had the voice for it until recently. I think it was one of those songs I just, like, 
you know, older me wrote it kind of, and then like went back inside and was waiting for me to get old enough to be able Unlock to sing it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you that tend, one I'm really proud of too. Do you tend to go back and like, is there, is there stuff that you've written like early on in your career where you were like, Oh, I'm ready to unearth this. This is like, this is. Yeah. No, no, right now, I think kind of some of the best stuff. There were two songs that had that. One was actually on my last record, Death and Taxes. Okay. It was the song Cigarettes. And that one was coming together. I think it could have been a high five drive song, but we we broke up before it ended up being that. So I resurrected it. And yeah, there's other songs here and there that like or ideas that have kind of been a, a great kind of like little chorusy part that sure, it just yeah. has never really come to light. But but I don't like to put a lot of pressure of like, I have to write this or I have to write that. It's more fun when the ideas come out. I'm also one of those people, like I, some people are constantly writing, not me. I like to hit the pause button on writing. And then about a year out from a record, start to like, okay, I got to start to get some ideas. Mm. Like, let's let's start the writing process of like, I'm going to sit down to write a song and whatever comes out, even if it's terrible. And generally, if I 12 songs, I probably write close to 20 and about eight of them get cut. And sometimes when I say wrote a song, I mean, I came up with a verse and a chorus and then garbage. A skeleton it. Like, it yeah. necessarily like write the whole song, record a demo. And then like most of them don't even get to that point. But, but for me, like I like that gap to kind of grow, you know, have, have some fresh ideas, fresh things. I feel like if you write songs too soon after you record a record, they just kind of sound like B sides of that record. Sure. Yeah. I also think pressure is good. I like the idea that like we're hitting the studio in a couple of weeks and I have nine good songs. I need another four. <laughs> so to kind of like, you know, we it's go time, everyone. Let's make this happen. I think <laughs> yeah, it yeah. worked well under pressure. So I think, I think you that's might. I think yeah, you just might. <laughs> yeah, I think it's another reason. You did make a really interesting comment, Greg, about um going back and listening to your previous album while obviously simultaneously working on this next this release that's out now um is that something you, you typically do because i that's the first that i've heard doing interviewing like i've never heard someone going back and le- being like okay where is greg at in this this year what am i going to like do you have like a continuing storyline or like how no, not necessarily i guess okay. more more just a, a refresher of like what are the other records sound like and mm. you know the the content on it yeah where was my head at but that doesn't necessarily like influence i have to write a record like this or like that like sure for the most part what comes out comes out and the latest one the theme of it and again not necessarily every record is a theme but the theme of this one uh was polarization and okay. you know, the fact that the world isn't necessarily black or white although would it would be easier if it was it isn't and that's kind of where I got the title from. And I have actually a couple of friends that are, you know, quite religious. I've had to make sure, like, I'm not dumping on religious people. I'm not <laughs> saying everyone that goes to church is a bad person. You sure, know, yeah. however, at the same time, it's not like good people go to church, bad people go to jail. And it was just more of a poetic way, I thought, to say that. Um, is that, yeah, like, you know, people are just people. We're not necessarily good people or bad people. It's it's not a question of that it's more like the entire world is easier to see as black and white. And I think a lot of people, not to get too political all of a sudden, but a lot of people in power want it to be that way. It's easier to control when people are just, you know, this or that. And when a lot of us are, are, you know, kind of posed to hate each other and fight each other, it's like a divide and conquer kind of situation. Sure, yeah. And I would love if this record would start some conversations. I'd love if someone would come up to me who is like really religious, or like, why do you hate religious people? And like, I'm gonna stop you there. Like, let's <laughs> let's start there and let's make sure it's it clear. I don't, yeah, I don't hate religious people at all. A lot of my my good friends are religious. Sure. And yeah. this is what I meant for the album. And and you know, it's I, I don't want to blame it on the internet, the fact that we're connected, you know, echo chambers, that buzz phrase that seems to bounce around. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I don't know exactly why we are so polarized right now in that if there is necessarily a reason or not. But I think one 
you know, place to talk to is to start to try to talk to each other and, yeah. and not just be like, this person is like this, that person is like that. And I'm not going and saying, go and hug a Nazi or anything like, yeah, there's <laughs> definitely people in the world whose ideas and views I don't support at all would never even sure, consider. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear it. You know, at the same time, that isn't everybody. Right. And, you know, I, I, I love to talk to people and, same. and yeah. I hope this record inspires more conversation. Well, I, I feel like it will, you know, I, I noticed, especially like trying to listen through and as you mentioned, like try to pick out some of the lyricism and, and stuff like that it was very interesting to like, to find like a lot of gray area in that sort of stuff. Like regardless of it's like religion, politics, whatever, like there, I just feel like a lot of people, it's normally not the people that are in the middle. It's normally whatever fringe side you're on and not to make this a political thing but it's like i i think it's like the the biggest mouths are on the far sides of each polar opposite you know like i think the people that talk the most and you know do the most shit talking are the people that you can hear the loudest you know i would imagine most people kind of fit within this gray spectrum of like I don't want to fight with like you know I don't want to fight with you that's not my that's not my lane you know what I mean everybody can go live how they want to live you know I'm not going to try to say like you should live this way specifically if that's you know if you want to be religious and religion is something that you know you hold to then that's your prerogative and you know I'm glad that you have found your way through that avenue but if like you're not religious and that's not your thing then that's also fine too I don't I don't think there's like a I don't think there's necessarily like one specific path that everybody has to follow for like for things to be right in your life, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I meet a lot of people on the road and I've stayed with a lot of people that are totally different than for than me and, and you know, working, working a job in not like I have a nine to five, like I work with all sorts of different people. And I feel there's always some kind of a common ground, you know, sure. like, oh, yeah, we all agree pizza tastes good. Like, is that a good start? You know, everyone <laughs> likes pizza, right? Like. Okay, cool. What else? You know, did did you laugh at this movie? Did you laugh at that movie? Do you yeah. like Star Wars? Star Wars? Like, there's always something to kind of talk about, and it can be lighthearted. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, something super duper serious. But but it's it's so easy to just not talk to people or just to kind of stay in your own little zone. Maybe maybe that is something we could somewhat blame on. You know, the accessibility of the world and sure, and, yeah the internet but at the same time i don't know if someone wants to just stay home all the time maybe that isn't a bad thing either like it's everyone's life is just their lives and i've tried really hard especially song number five when you throw it back in and continue off song number five is a lot about that of how like people are just people let's let's try to start there let's you know give everyone their respect and and you know just because this person is this don't necessarily hate the shit out of them because it doesn't necessarily jive with your views or something and you know i'm going to be very vague i'm going to leave that way open because i no I, no apply to anyone right like, uh sure i i feel the same way i feel like it's not like you know a person is a person regardless of if like you know there's going to be things that you agree with there's going to be things that you disagree with and vice versa you know it's just about if you're able to communicate those things to that other person and if they're receptive and are able to hear it and vice versa then like i think that that's oh that should be the open type of conversation you should have with someone you know um you know there's some things that i greg and i probably don't agree on but you know we're online talking to each other via the internet you know so like hey it it happens and like i said no matter how you look at it it's like uh you know you want to you want to be able to treat people with the respect that hopefully you would like to receive in return you know so hey there you you said it that is just to be excellent to each other right there you go that's why i have greg on here you know i I respect greg's musicianship so let's uh let's keep it going greg we're gonna (laughs) move on to the next one which is uh who are you jamming to now who are some artists that you're listening to as of currently that you you've really been loving uh, so uh, Jeff Rosenstock's latest record, oh, okay. uh, Hell Mode. I can't remember this. I'm terrible with song titles because I just kind of like throw it on. I'll but look it's it the up. Second, I got you. Second song, yeah. Boom, it's on my head. It kind of starts with like 8-bit drums. Mm, and okay. uh, that's that's been kind of, you know, living rent-free in my head. 
Uh, recently, uh, the festival I just did, Kanon performed. Ooh, and okay. I've heard of this music before. Who hasn't? He's like, uh, the wave your flag, wave of <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. That was a bad impression of it. Sorry, Kanon or Kanon fans <laughs> that are. But there's a song he did. It was called Fatima. Uh, and uh, okay. it, it's just been, again, living rent free in my head now for since the concert. And it's such a touching story, too. He's originally from Somalia. And it was like his first love, basically, he was saying this this woman that lived in, in you know, the same neighborhood he did. And he moved to, to, to North America and found out like literally days later she was murdered and he was saying like it happened so much in in somalia or, or his neighborhood i don't know if necessarily the whole country his neighborhood that like people don't really even talk about it you just kind of accept it happened and moved mm. on and yeah, it's heartbreaking and he wrote this beautiful song and that's kind of been another one that i've been been going for but having just done a music festival like man i you know, I think some nights we had about 10 bands and the festival itself um, is uh, seven plus uh, 10 days long. And I, again, it's a French cultural festival. So a lot of fiddles. So there's a lot of fiddle tunes kind of <laughs> in here right now and stuff. But you got some fiddle melodies floating around in your head somewhere, you know. Exactly. Uh, but I, and- I, I love uh, I'm excited to go on tour and I love seeing artists I've never heard of, like playing with someone and hearing their music live to me is the best thing ever. And of course I love records and I love, you know, when someone gives you the CD or the whatever, and you go check yeah. it out after, but on tour, one of the things I look forward to as much as playing is being in the audience and listening to, to everyone. And one thing that's hard, cause you know, again, when you're on tour, you're trying to ride that line where like, I want to be sociable. I want to be friendly. I want to meet new people at the same time as someone's on stage and you always have like your buddy who is like talking Shocking, to you and yeah. trying to like, you know, uh, thank you. I want to, you know, I want to watch the show. Yeah, yeah. But you don't want to like tell them to shut the fuck up. You're just trying to like <laughs> politely like, you know, and they're talking like normal voices. And oh, and you can't even hear talk it. normal yeah, voice. Every yeah. time, like, you know, but oh. anyways, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what's been in my, my head as of late. And I can't wait to get more in there on this next tour. I, f- I feel that I'm kind of I'm, I'm the same way like if people are chatting me up I'm just like I'm normally I'm here to ch- do stuff at a show so I'm like working normally so I'm like can't re- I mean I'd love to chat but I like chat with me in between sets or something like that like I, and also you know you're at a show like I feel like you should be paying respect to the artists that are playing the show for you, regardless of you like the music or not. Like, I don't know. That's just me. Maybe it's, maybe I'm getting older, but like, I feel like to me, it's always like, I want to be able to show like, you know, I'm, I'm paying money or I've gotten into the show because, you know, I want to be able to support the acts that are on there. So, um, I think that's crucial, but the Jeff, the Jeff Rosenstock, the last album, the three singles were, uh, liked you better doubt, or heel mode. I don't know if that's what you were referring to. Oh, here, maybe I'll have a quick, quick look on the old technology here. <laughs> uh, I mean, the whole album is awesome. And I think he does a good job too, that it's not just like one sound, like here's a song, here's another song that kind of sounds like that. Here's another <laughs> song. Like, you know, some of it is kind of Weezer ish. Some of it yeah. is, it's, it's all over the place. Go check out that record. Everyone make a note. Um, I have a one track mind. I am trying very, very hard. Uh, it's oh, right. another one. The Strum Bellas also played that festival, and Ooh, that's okay. another band where, like, I had heard of them, not really know their music, and then I saw them live, and like, there we go, instant fan. Like, well I'll done. Yeah. Uh, if you do searching, not remember it, Greg, right off the bat, you can always send it to me. I'll throw it in. So, head. H-E-A-D, head, head, like my head. Okay. Yeah, head. which makes bomb inside my head. It makes sense now. Ah, uh, okay. Perfect. All right. That is, yeah, I have the whole record. Don't just listen to that one, but if you only have time to listen to one, that's my personal fave on that record, but. There we go. We love Jeff Rosenstock. Great stuff. Um, yeah. Oh, and another, ahead, another thing ahead. I wanted to mention, I find it very hard to choose. And whether it is the clothes I'm wearing or the music I'm going to listen to next, 
And I've heard I'm not trying to compare myself to Albert Einstein, <laughs> but I heard he also had a similar problem to the point that all his outfits were the same. So he didn't have to choose what to wear. He yeah. just had everything was the same. What I do, all my T-shirts are just in my drawer and I grab the next one. And my, you know, my, my partner helps put them, put them away. She's amazing. Oh, and she nice. just rotates the stock. So I just go with whatever <laughs> one. I just wear one once. I never have to choose. You and when it comes it. to listening to music, I have like somewhat of a respectable record collection, nothing to write home about. Sure. And I basically have three shelves. The bottom shelves are okay records or not great records, as I like to sometimes say. Sure. Middle shelf is good records. Top shelf, I call my super elite. You grab from the right, replace to the left. And you just when you going. grab a record, you put it on and you have to listen to it. You have to decide, should this be on the good shelf? Should it go down to not great? Or should it be elevated to the super elite? elite shelf, super literally elite. letting the best rise to the top. So when friends come over and you want to wow them, you have that automatically <laughs> like all these records and a lot of the time too, like part of the fun part of records for me is some of like the dollar bins, right? Some of that media has gotten so cheap CDs too, but records are a lot easier to store. I find, but sure. you can go and just buy like anything, you know, this record looks interesting. Oh, I've heard this name. Like I'm just buying that one for no reason at all. And then you can kind of discover a lot of new neat stuff that you might not find other ways. And you know, I think like Spotify and Apple Music, not to hate the shit out of the modern way to listen to music, even sure. though they you know, don't necessarily pay uh, artists. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, it's cool that they'll suggest like, oh, you listened to this. A bunch of people liked that. Here, check this out. Like, you know, people are exploring and listening to new music all the time. And I think I think that's great. And I don't I don't think it's a dark, you know, future for music necessarily, but um the the other thing i'm kind of jumping around here no, you're and i good. apologize about that but uh having worked like music festivals for years and having kind of experienced like now music is everywhere right like you go to the mall there's music playing in the mall oh, you yeah. go into a store it's a different it's song music, yeah. that next song different song like music is part of our lives more than it's ever been at the same time i don't know if people are listening That's i think true. it's become background agree. stuff and i know the job I was working at for a while when I had more of a regular job. Now I'm just kind of like dude for hire when you need an audio technician. But a lot of the people I worked with, they were into like lo-fi Sunday. They were into like background music, right? It's just like chill stuff. And I liked it too. If we were hanging out, we're kind of talking, you know, yeah, we're doing yeah, yeah. work at the shop. It's neat to have something in the background, but that, and then festivals, like people there for the drugs, right? Like people are there to do a bunch of drugs, have a good time. And that's fine. There ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, it kind of, it makes me think of uh, no offense to rave culture, but. Um, <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to mention this. One, yeah. one of my favorite that's jokes fair. is, fair. you know, what did, what did the raver say when the drugs wore off? Nothing. Dude, this music sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do. I do love, I was super into nineties rave stuff. I love all music, but. I, but I mean, just I feel you though. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm straight edge, so I don't, I don't consume any of that stuff. So it's like I, I just enjoy it because I enjoy music, you know. So maybe I just have an objective opinion on it. But I, I feel you on. Sometimes it's luckily for the job that I work, like I just can throw headphones in and just listen to whatever yeah. I'm listening to. So it's like nice to get suggestions for groups or like people, like Val, shout out to Val again. Like they'll be like, hey would you like to interview this person? And then I try to go and do my due diligence as an interviewer and try to like listen to, you know, what, whoever I'm having on, whatever they're doing. Um, I think that's pretty crucial, but yeah, I, I, I try to implore a lot of my listener base to just listen to it. You know, I think it's, I think you often overlook like also the amount of time and effort that people take into making music, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's not an easy craft. It's not like, I mean, obviously anybody can make music and there are people with innate musical talent, but, uh, I think it's so difficult for like people to just kind of like, they're like, Oh my God, when's the next song coming out? As soon as like the album is finished, like they're like, Oh my God, when's the new music coming out? And I, I feel like it's, you don't often get to savor it, you know? It's just kind of like, oh, cool, what's the next thing? You know, and it's like, oh, I just spent two years working on 12 tracks. 
I'm going to spend another two years working on the next, <laughs> the next 12 track album or whatever, you know, I, I think people, at least for me, and again, this might be the old, old person in me, but like, I, I feel like it's important for people to kind of actively listen and take the time to listen to it. I know not all the time you're going to be able to do that, but I try to do my best to really sit down and listen to it unless I'm like editing then I'll throw lo-fi on and just like tunnel visions me into finishing the editing faster but um but yeah I think I I, I I'm glad you mentioned that because I think it's really important for people to really take the time to listen because there's a lot of there's a lot of things that people talk about especially I would argue within like the alternative space of music that you know I, I feel like you might miss out on and there could be some really crucial things or things that people would like you to hear you know so take the yeah, time to listen. yeah exactly and again like the the buddy that like wants to catch up at the show where you're like man there's a cool band on stage like i want to talk to you but like let's talk after yeah let's yeah, yeah. Talk when you're on stage or... yeah yeah exactly like actively listening that's what i tell people i'm just like talk to me mid set like at not mid set talk to me after the set like in between sets or just talk to me after the show. I'm like probably one of the last people to leave the venue. So just hang out unless you can't stay later, which I get like, just come hang out. Like that's, that's what I tell people is like, I'd love to chat, but if I'm there, I'm either there to enjoy the music and immerse myself or I'm doing work and I'm there to do work and also immerse myself. So either way yeah. I'm immersing in it. So we both have fun jobs. We both have fun jobs. I would, I would argue. But there's um, still jobs sometimes. Still jobs, <laughs> yeah. Still got, still got to do some stuff. But the next question I have for you, Greg, is I don't know your stances on cover songs, but if there was one to add to your repertoire right now, is there any song that comes to mind that you'd like to add to that list? Oh man, uh, yes, I am very pro cover song. Okay. I have covered John Prine on my punk acoustic record. Oh, nice. Uh, Death and Taxes, I covered The Pogues. Oh, uh, Sins okay. Of Whiskey. And then the last record, I covered this artist, Mischief Brew, who was actually from the Philadelphia area. Oh, sick. Eric Peterson. Yeah. Sadly, Eric died by suicide. Oh. We, we miss him a lot, man. Wherever you are, Eric, thinking of you, buddy. But I covered uh, one of his songs on the last record. Um, so I'm really pro cover songs. One I've been wanting to do and, you know, potentially next record, potentially not, is by an artist named Leo Sayer. Okay. You ever mm. heard Leo Sayer? I have not. No, I'll have to go check it out. You might know the song. I'm, I won't, I'm not great at doing impression. I'm going to do my best. Here we go. You make me feel like dancing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was him. He had a whole bunch of other hits. Okay. And he was actually on the Muppet show. And during the pandemic, like so many people, my partner and I went through like, hey, do you like the Muppet show? Let's watch all 178 <laughs> episodes. Like, you know, we just binged the Muppet show for like a week straight when we were fucking had nothing to do but get drunk and watch the Muppet show. Sure, yeah. So nonetheless, the Leo Sayer episode comes on. And I remembered it when I was a kid being terrified of it because he comes <laughs> on dressed as a clown in like the sad clown makeup. Oh no, yeah. And, like, like ever I'm since out, I've been always out. been scared of clowns. I'm yeah. Out, like yeah. even as an adult, I still I feel a it. bit worried. Yeah, yeah. We're on the same boat, Craig. <laughs> Nonetheless, he did this song and I was like, holy shit, like this song is amazing. So I found another version of it. And I ended up like kind of half learning it. And I think I I did it in the wrong key. I got to rework it to make sure I could sing it properly. Sure. Yeah. But I think it's like true and true. It's meant to be a punk song. And there's a big scatting part in the middle of it. And I think it's destined to be a Greg Rika song at some point. So that is that is another one. But I have like ever so often being a folk punk dude, ever so often you get stuck with a show where they're like, yeah, if you play for three hours, we'll toss you like a hundred bucks. You know, it's like a Tuesday. So you need a giant repertoire and you're just background noise. Like we were talking, like yeah. even reluctantly, sometimes I got to be background noise, oh. but those kind of shows, I have a whole series of punk covers of like acoustic kind of done punk ish covers. And, you know, part of the neat thing of having somewhat of a unique voice is I just sing a song normal and then it kind of becomes like a neat, my version of the song. The Greg version. I yeah. can't really do an impressions of anyone, but if I just be myself playing this song, it's automatically like, oh, neat. And so I, I feel like I kind of get away with it. And I think um, Show Must Go On is the title of the song by Leo Sayer. That's going to be, you know, the next planned, you know, cover attempt. Let's go. Very cool. I, I like that. That 
I'm not gonna ever remember. I'm not gonna ever forget that now that I know it's associated with clowns and the Muppet Show. I'm gonna, yeah, unfortunately you, remember that. <laughs> right. If you can find it online, if you want to see it or no, hear the song, I don't. I don't want to see that. <laughs> okay. Understood. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm Respect. putting that. I'm putting that in the mind bank, and that's that's yeah. where it's going. That's it. I, I don't want to see it. No offense right. to you, Greg. <laughs> no, I'm Jake. Um. That's a great track. I'm about it. If you have any more suggestions for Greg, let him know down in the comment section. I feel like he'd probably be more willing to do it. So if you have, yeah, ones, I'd love, I love suggestions. There we go. The next question I have for you, Greg, another fun one. What is your favorite food to eat? What's your go-to? Oh man. So I eat vegan. Ah, and I've been okay. eating vegan. I've been a vegetarian for over 20 years and about the last maybe 13, I'm going to say I've done it vegan. And not like the super ist strict. Like I still eat honey. You know, mm. someone cooked a big meal. They accidentally put butter in it. Like you're not going to eat the meal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, you know, at some point it's like, are we just wasting food? Me refusing to eat this because of my, sure. my dance of, you know, eating animal and animal products. Um, at the same time, I, I do try really, really hard to, to eat vegan. Sure. Uh, on tour, it can be tougher sometimes too. Um, things I love to eat though. Uh, there is an amazing restaurant in Winnipeg called Spring Roll, and they oh. do kind of like a northern Chinese style food, but they do it vegan. That is incredible. Um, I think a lot of like the Beyond Meat chicken fingers, the Impossible chicken fingers. Uh, I loved chicken fingers as a meat eater, and then you know when I started eating vegetarian, I definitely missed them. And I feel a lot of the latest ones are a lot closer uh, to kind of how. So I don't mind the alternative meats. On top of that, like, you know, a hella good curry that is made with chickpeas is is amazing. It doesn't have to be a meat, pretend meat for me to like it. Like, sure. Just food in general, I am a, a food lover. Um, in terms of stuff I can make that I think is really, really good, I, I can do vegan sushi, and I think I do it quite well. So I'd, I'd like oh. to brag a little bit there. Okay. And then are you familiar with Satan? Oh, yeah. I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not saying Satan, but with the no, I know the wrong <laughs> level. Like wow, we're getting back to the religion topic already. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am quite the uh, adept uh, Satan uh, chef, and uh -huh. I'm really proud of it. What I'll do a lot of time, either we'll just do a big old seitan steak or I'll like shave it really, really thin and we'll do it with like noodles, maybe oh. with like a barbecue sauce or something like that. So those are kind of some of the better dishes I can make. I love my own cooking, which I don't know if everybody like in the world secretly does or if you don't, it's just because you I, suck at cooking, As but. someone who cooks as well, and I, I mean, I don't, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I do try to like at least like one or two meals a week, I try to make like vegan or vegetarian probably more closer to vegetarian than vegan but i like for the longest time i was like ew i don't know if i like tofu but now i love tofu tofu is like underrated yeah. you know it, it i feel like it satiates pretty well compared to like meat you know like obviously i you know i'm not vegan or vegetarian but i feel like it's a good it's a good substitute but i i always see satan and i don't i don't always pick it up for whatever reason so now i'm gonna have to take a cue out of your book and pick up some seitan probably yeah if, if you're i could do a tutorial video on how to make it if you ever want <laughs> listen I, I feel like this I'm I'm online i'm like no i've made these mistakes i've perfected the <laughs> recipe um but i if i had to pick like a favorite all-time food it would be pasta oh ever since i was a kid like pasta and red sauce pasta in some kind of other pasta with fried mushrooms pasta garlic i think uh, Italian food on the most part is, I think, the the genius of food. And I absolutely have toured Italy 12 times. I'll be going there again this spring, and I absolutely love the food. But so many times, like pizza without cheese. I don't mind some of the cheese alternatives. For the most part, no thanks. I'm not a big fan of cheeseless sure. pizza. Yeah. And the pizza they do there is like, you know, like razor thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what they'll end up doing, they'll bake for it. First of all, they don't cut it for you. It's just this big thing of dough. <laughs> and then if they do cut it, you kind of pick up the piece. And because there's no cheese and it's so thin, it just kind of goes around. Yeah, just flat. You know, they have yeah, this yeah, pasta. Yeah. It's like a breadstick with a little cape. And it just, everything falls off. So you're just kind of eating dough and then like. Scooping handing, it, like, scooping it up. Yeah. Vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I cannot say I'm a big fan. I actually, every time I ask, I'm like, 
I don't expect anyone to make me food or I, nothing is guaranteed. I'm not saying that. However, if you are going to make anything for me, can it please be pasta in Italy? So that is my polite request to all the Italian friends and there hosts. You go. Yeah, I absolutely adore pasta. That would be my favorite of all time if I had to pick one. I I would agree with that. As as someone who also has been to Italy, I, I can say it's pizza there is different than pizza in the northern America. You know, there's something something interesting about it that I really like. You know, there was one pizza I had that was just like, which if you are not a carb lover, you're gonna hate this. But it was basically pizza dough, and then they like shaved some potato like into like hash brown type things, and then they put like a mountain of like cheese on it, and then they put like garlic on garlic butter on it or whatever. Wow. It was like it was great, but it was like as Greg says, it's just like completely like just deflates. structural integrity gone. yeah, gone. yeah, yeah. One, one out of ten if it was a bridge, I would be dead for sure. there's no <laughs> way be able to cross you know cross any of that sort of stuff but yeah i yeah shout outs to shout outs to italian pizza always great stuff would love to go back um but the next question i have for you greg is if you were to have a dream collaboration on an up-and-coming song you would like to do who would you love to have on the question actually gets split into two answers what's one that's like a little bit more feasible like somebody you know closely or like you know know pretty well that you would love to get on a track and you know you haven't had the you haven't like politely nudged them a little bit you know uh so this is the time to say it and then the second part of the answer is the manifestation we're putting it out there right, the right. for you so what would you be your oh, two man. answers like well, first off i've been uh friends for years with mikey erg I originally have the band The Ergs, but but kind of having carved out his own uh, solo thing for years and years and years. And uh, we played together in Winnipeg. He was coming through with Tony Sly and Dave Haas, and I was the the stiff who got to open that bill. And he didn't have a place to stay the next couple of days. He was flying out of Winnipeg. I, I can't remember why his flight wasn't, like, anytime sooner. <laughs> so when he was staying with us, we kind of made buds. And then I almost immediately, I was touring the States later that year and he helped me with the show and we oh. kind of just made friends. And, and every time I come through the area, he's, he's actually on tour with Laura Jane Grace when I'm through, which is, you know, a def acceptable reason to you know, <laughs> miss my show, obviously. Um, nonetheless, I always wanted, loved, would love to do something with him. And right now the band I have is so great. Like I wouldn't want anyone right now in the band, not necessarily to play on the record. The same time it would be really neat if me and me and Mike got to do something together. And I don't think it's unrealistic. I think definitely at some point in the future, we'll, we'll make that happen. And then in terms of like collaborating with someone else, that's, that's a tougher one. Cause there's so many people that come to mind and to pick one more than the other. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, would be, would be kind of a tough thing. Um, but if I'm just going to go for it because I was a big fan of the band leg wagon kind of, you know, growing up and I know Joey Cape has one week records and I think it like, it's too big for me. Like it's definitely out of the reach. Like I would need to get a ladder and then put a ladder on top of that to ever get to a level where he might want to do a record yeah, with me at the same time. Like, you know, loved his songwriting and his his uh, his band for years. To, to this very day, I still listen to Lagwagon. So I think it'd be really cool if it was like, yeah, let's do a record together and like you tell me what you think of my songs or you know sing sing back up on some of them if they want to. But that list goes on and on. Like any of those '90s punk bands, I would love to collaborate with Flat Fat Mike if it could ever come up or something or like. Um, I was a big fan of uh, Strung Out and Jim Cherry, I know, did a lot of the songwriting for that. Yeah. It'd be cool if we could resurrect him and he could, you know, do something together with me or, yeah, so many people, man. Like, it's, it's, it'd be tough to pick just one, but <laughs> if I did have to, those would be my two. Those would be great picks. So, yeah. you know, guys, you know, the typical time that I ask this question, well, I need you to go first, follow Greg on Instagram if you haven't already, because you should do that. But then you should tag all of Greg's picks and then type collab question mark in your Instagram story and then just send it, you know? I I mean, we're on the internet, so it's probably got to be real to some degree, I feel, <laughs> you know? So 
I, I don't know. I feel like you can do it. I, I trust I trust you'll be able to do one a good thing for Greg, you know. I Thanks. I'm gonna do it. So Aww. I feel like you should do it. Y'all are so sweet. Thank you so much. There we go. Well, the next question, Greg, continuing on with the same trend a little bit. Uh if you were to compile a dream tour lineup including yourself, who would you just love to go on tour with? Oh man. Well, again, I kind of as we were talking, I would absolutely love to tour with my band. So let's say in this scenario, we are doing whole band, yeah, okay, yeah, doing a, a band tour, and uh, huge fan of of Laura Jane Grace. Would love to do you know a tour where get to support her and or against me or whatever whatever project she's going to do. Um, my friend Mike, you know, and Mikey Erg, it would be awesome if it was a solo thingy. I've always wanted to do something with him, like in Europe or something. Um, oh man, like Chuck Reagan would be incredible to tour with that dude. And no, even some of my, like my friend, John Creedon, I love the shit out of him. He's not very well known. He's on the East coast right now. We did a bunch of touring when I first started. Like if I could just push a button and magic happens, like it'd be <laughs> so fun, you know, to resurrect a Greg Rikus, John Creedon tour again and kind of do that. But any of those 90 punk bands though, like if we can be not to say they're not still great, a lot of them can still rip, but it'd be so neat to kind of like go out with, you know, uh, no effects in their heyday oh. or open up for bad religion in like, you know, 1992. But as, as I am now with all the, like the talent <laughs> and everything I have from years and years of honing my craft. But Yeah. I feel like every, you know, I think it's interesting as I, especially as me as getting older, like in interviewing bands, like I hope that I can have the same sort of longevity or, be a little bit better of an interviewer year year over year you know i think that's really crucial and obviously your testament of becoming better over time so i feel like you know i feel like i'm pretty good i, I feel like i'm gonna be good when i'm doing this for 20 years you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah in a non-conceited way like i i always fear our coming across as like i am the best and it's not that at all but at the same time i don't think like to say i'm confident I've worked really hard to be a good musician sure. and I think I'm okay. I don't think that's too much to say. And hopefully my inbox doesn't fill up with hate mail. Uh, no, no. I, I feel like there, I feel like there's a line between being like confident and like being positive and like knowing that like what you do is great. But I feel like there's like that fine line of like always saying like, Oh, I'm good. But like, I can always be better. And that's like, yeah, kind of it's that, well put. Well, that's put. that's the tagline I try to live by. You know, is yeah. like, I'm I'm pretty good, but you know, there's people out there that have been interviewing longer than I have, and you know, I always try to learn learn from them. You know, so then yeah. at that point, when I'm that age, then I can be at that level, or maybe yeah, a little exactly. better. Who knows? So, but great tour. If you guys want to make that happen as well, you you know what to do. So go do it up, <laughs> but. The next question I have for you, Greg, is another fun one. What is your favorite TV show, favorite movie? Oh, man. So this is always, like, favorite of favorite. It's so hard to pick, right? Sure, I think yeah. I've probably said that before. I've said all of these. But if I did have to pick one favorite movie, it would probably still be The Big Lebowski. Oh, yeah. Okay. I absolutely, like, gigantic Coen Brothers fan and that movie, I first discovered it, it was like maybe 1999, the year 2000. I think it had already been out for a while, and it was just developing its cult classic sure. status. Yeah. I think the the people I was living with, the house I was living in, there was like six of us renting this shitty house in Osborne Village in Winnipeg forever. And I think that movie was on once, if not twice a day. Like, we would <laughs> spin it all the time. I know it almost like verbatim. Wow. And I th oh, still to this day, almost every time I watch it, there's still like another little part I missed or some little line or like, you know, all those little hidden Easter eggs or yeah. a joke that I didn't really necessarily get in that way until now. It's <laughs> I think the rewatchability of that movie is off the charts. If you haven't watched it in a while, throw it on again. I have all have um, to. Yeah. In terms of TV show, I mean, I guess like classic Simpsons, if it had to be an all time lifetime favorite that has played a giant role in terms of the impact on, you know, my sense of humor. Sure. And I think also kind of my attention to the world. I think the Simpsons in those first, you know, nine to 10 seasons were very good at kind of pointing out, you know, similar to like, like the daily show, how it's kind of like, you know, comically 
kind of i don't necessarily satire like what's the call it's funny it's but satire. it's satire yeah it is definitely yeah, exactly yeah. They're, they're being funny but it's very serious things and sure, I think the simpsons yeah. were good at that more recently though i've been a lot more into rick and morty oh and wow, i know there okay. was something i i can't remember which person was recently canceled i think there was some really horrible stuff that came out if it was the voice guy i know dan Harmon and justin Roiland, one of those dudes sure um and so they had to replace the voice of rick and morty on the show and if it happened last season i've already watched the last season i think season seven we're on now i didn't really notice i thought it was still good i still enjoy it i mean it's not necessarily for everyone and they probably ride the line on some stuff and i think if some people are easily offended and you, you haven't seen it somehow yeah. Yeah, maybe don't go out and watch it. At the same time, I think it's another show that you could put on over and over and over again. Even sometimes when I'm on tour, like you, I drive a lot uh, by myself, and I'll, I'll just put it on the background. I won't watch, obviously, I'm driving. <laughs> I'll just listen. And it's incredible how funny it is even when you just listen to it. And I think yeah. I notice a lot of jokes when I'm like, oh, because you're not necessarily watching. Like, all yeah. you got is the dialogue, so you're listening very, very hard. Um, but that's another show I like where you can rewatch it, rewatch it. I feel they kind of got a little bit to say, you know, a bit of a commentary on kind of what's going on in the world, not necessarily directly, always, possibly sometimes more indirectly, but I feel yeah, those are my those are some good answers. Yeah, I, I've I feel you on the the Simpsons one. I got into it much later in my like young adulthood. Um, but now I I don't watch it regularly, but I'll see like clips and stuff. And I, I think it's like, I think, you know, their writers are just so brilliant. So shouts to them for doing that. But yeah, Rick and Morty, I feel like was a show I never really got into. I have seen like a decent amount of episodes, but I don't know. It's just something like some of the stuff's pretty funny. I'll, I'll give them credit on that. Like there are definitely some moments where I was like, actually like not like, fake laughing i guess per se but like you know i was actually enjoying it and thought it was hilarious um but i'll have to maybe i'll have to sit down and actually watch some more like episodes and stuff but i i it was a show i never really got into and quite frankly i just never have enough time to watch tv sit down and watch tv most times i'm just watching youtube videos on my tv or yeah. whatever to go to bed so yeah, yeah i never have time either so i think season five is maybe one of the best all oh. like the earlier seasons if you want to start at the start if you're kind of one of those watchers I am, you're just yeah. gonna cherry pick one i think five isn't a bad place to start okay i'll have to i'll have to cherry pick season five or i don't know i'm a serial watcher so i feel like i'll probably wind up starting from season one and from migrate dead, yeah, and respect there. I mean, you gotta know it all right you gotta I know, know it all. all yeah yeah there's definitely gonna be some like storylines that i'll be like i don't how the hell did this happen you know and then i'll have to go back and watch it anyway so um but yeah great great choices and i haven't watched the big lebowski in quite a while i think my first time watching it i was just like my no joke my first expression was like what the fuck is this movie because like i don't i don't think i got it like there was stuff watching it and i'm like i don't think it's clicking like i don't understand why people like like this movie and I was kind of more like confused if anything. And I had some friends of mine at the time. They were like, I feel like you have to watch it again. Like there's, there's something about that movie that like, as you continue to like serially watch it, like you're going to understand it more. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. I, I would have never like, I would have never thought that that was a movie that you have to like repeat watch and you get like more nuggets of things. And obviously I've had multiple people say like, yeah, I've seen this movie a bunch of times, but there's always something new that I like find out about in this movie that I didn't notice the like 80th time I've watched it. And that's always interesting to me that, you know, writers can have that sort of like long lasting effect of like, hey we want you to get more out of it here's like another little like little nugget of funness that we didn't tell you about you know or that you didn't pick up on watching it before yeah and no, i think like john goodman's character is absolutely oh, hilarious yeah. <laughs> you know that was steve buscemi and then uh, jeff bridges like those three the way they are able to do that i i would love to know more behind the scenes like i'd love to sit down with the coen brothers and just be like how many times did you shoot that scene like <laughs> 
you know like did you is it was it like a three or four was it like 50 takes like did they do this scene all day for multiple days and then this is just like the best of the best or something like i'd love to know they were yeah i feel like i i feel like it's the latter honestly i feel like they probably just they they probably just like kept hammering it in until like the delivery was just like that's it we got it you know what i mean like that's exactly but also like i think spontaneity is is so important especially in terms of comedy and oh, yeah. uh, one of my partner's favorite movies is what about bob it was just uh, oh. her birthday and we actually we watched it that was the end of our night just throwing Happy that one on yeah. what i didn't realize is bill murray and richard dreyfus hated each other or at least richard, richard dreyfus hated bill murray i don't know if it was reciprocal and it's like you've seen the movie I have, yeah. Oh my yeah, god, so I didn't even know if that. Anyone else has seen it? But like the whole concept is, um, Bill Murray's character is like somewhat mentally ill. Richard Dreyfus is like his therapist. Yeah, and you know Richard Dreyfus is trying to go on vacation, get away from him, and he follows him there, and it's just like bucking the shit out of him. And I heard a lot of that was like not necessarily acting. Like Richard <laughs> Dreyfus wanted to do the scene as it was rehearsed, and Bill Murray was riffing on it. He was just going way off script, kind of doing whatever he wants, right? And so it, it was to capture that on film, right? To get that for those performances of like, I don't. I wonder often like the Big Lebowski and that kind of stuff. Like, was John Goodman just kind of riffing on the lines of just oh, like he's got an it, idea? Yeah. Or are the Coens more like, that's not how we do things. Like, this is how we want it. And they did it over and over and over. But. It, yeah, it would be, it'd be interesting to peer into the mind of that. Like, and I, I very similarly kind of had the same thought about Big Lebowski was like, oh, man, how many times did they like beat this scene into the ground? Or did they just like keep going until like the riff was just right? And they were like, good thing we were filming it. We got it. Like, that's it. Yeah. Like. Oh man, that that would be crazy. Be a fly on the wall on those types of movies would be interesting, certainly. But the next question I have for you, Greg, is if you were trapped on a desert island for the next month and there was one album you could bring with you to listen to, what album would it be? Ooh, the the mm. I feel like a month is it's like random. a little bit more palatable. I I know some people say like if you, like your desert island album is like the album you'll listen to forever no matter what. I feel like a month is like the perfect amount of time to digest a record, I'd argue. Yeah, not necessarily not necessarily get sick of it kind of way. Yeah. It would be hilarious if I was like my latest record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could do it. that. Hey, listen. No, 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 yeah. no. I wouldn't want to. <laughs> um, I think if I did have to pick a personal fave of mine that has been uh, a favorite record forever is something to write home about by the Get Up Kids. Ooh. To the point where I, I even have the, the logo, I have a tattoo oh, on it. Oh, that's sick. Yeah. On my arm. And I feel it's it's such a good of like, you know, it kind of brings you up and it brings you down. The last song is just kind of sending you home. Like, it could be that record that I think I put on multiple times a day as I'm, you know, scavenging for the next month on on this island for whatever I'm going to eat. And I wouldn't get sick of it. And I so always... I, I, tough choice for that be mine. I always love when people answer that question. They're just like, they're like, man, Brandon must be such an asshole for just leaving me on an island that's just like deserted and doesn't have anything. I'm like, I didn't even say any of that stuff. You're just putting it like, now you're just like, I'm oh, like, if yeah. that's how you want to live, that's fine. I, I just said like, you're on an island. That doesn't necessarily mean it's like a desert stranded. You're not like, uh, um what the fuck's that movie tom hanks castaway you're not castaway right, right. you know what i mean like Wilson, i feel like yeah. people ultimately go to that that position of like it's oh it's castaway or nothing you know and i'm like <laughs> it's not castaway i did not say this it's not lost it's not any of those tv shows or movies that are on an island where you're just stuck there forever i'm like uh, you know I, I would hope I'm a little bit nicer of like, you know, yeah. an yeah. island god. Well, you know? either way, you, you know, I don't mind the challenge, man. If that's okay. my challenge in life, so be it. Hey, listen, I respect I respect the drive, you know. I feel like it has, <laughs> you know, the 25 years of doing music, if that hasn't driven you, then, you know, if that hasn't given you the drive to get off the island, I don't, you know, hey, listen, <laughs> I don't know what will, but. Uh, to learn to endure the island. <laughs> you have to learn from the island. I, I respect that. Um <laughs> But the last thing, Greg, uh, thank you for spending the time, of course. Um, but Thanks so much for having me. Of course, of course. Well, I wanted to know, I always end off this interview with, like, arguably the most loaded question that I have in my gauntlet. But 
I wanted to know why music is important to you. You know, obviously you've been doing this over a 25 year plus span. Um, and I wanted to know why it's, it's still crucial to you, why you carve out, you know, years, you know, a good chunk of your life doing this. Like, I, I think I have a lot more respect uh, not that I didn't before this, but like, you know, I have a lot of respect for musicians, you know, that's why I have them on. That's why I love talking to them. Um, so I want to know what kind of drives your, your passion to do this, you know? Yeah. I mean, the plain old, there's so many reasons, but the plain old love of music, just, you know, I like, I like hearing music. It, it's something very, very special to me and uh, all styles, right? Obviously like punk is kind of more what has attracted me the most and and you know as a teenager when i was really starting to get into music um i struggled like everybody else you know no one necessarily has it easy growing up there's not much of a roadmap everybody has a different course and music really gave me kind of a base like i could you know on the way to the bus in the morning going to school you know i always had my headphones on it was kind of a bit of an escape or listening to the lyrics, knowing kind of people felt the same as I did. That was something very important. And um, when I was kind of in my later teens, when I bought a guitar, started playing myself, it felt like I want to be a part of this more than just I'm I'm a listener. You know, I, I don't want to be a, a passive participant in the music scene. I want to be an active one. I want to be the guy who puts on the concerts. I want to be the guy on stage. And mm -hmm. That kind of inspired me to, okay, I, I got the guitar. I want to practice, want to get better, write songs, and, you know, really defined my life in so many ways. Um, when I was in my early 20s and started touring with the band, that was kind of like the final catalyst to where, yep, it is decided this is what I'm going to do as long as I can do it. I assume at some point in my life, like everyone, you know, health problems are a thing. Unfortunately, we all get older I'm lucky that at the the ripe age of 43, I'm still somewhat able-bodied. I still have somewhat of a voice, like my fingers still work. <laughs> I'm luck, lucky that some people who, uh, you know, experience like arthritis or stuff like that or lose their voice because maybe they sing out of the range for too long or just have a delicate sure, voice. Yeah. Like one of those lucky people, I can just, I'm a tank. You know, I'm like Beskar. I can just keep keep rolling down the hill and I'm totally fine yeah. every time. <laughs> playing the guitar uh no matter what abuse i put myself through which i feel very very lucky for that and i hope i could kind of keep it going but i i think just being so inspired of of music and seeing how much it has to offer and how much hope it can give people and that i can be more than just the person who throws the headphones on that you yeah. know i can be an active person in it and writing songs i still think i have something to say and I sometimes I wonder if anyone's even listening. Um, sometimes I wonder how important that is if everyone is listening or not. Because I, I think I like to think like if zero people was listening, I'm not writing the songs only for me. I'm writing it because I believe people still want to hear the music. Sure. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, in another three years or so, when you know it's time to kind of do a new record, I already have like, oh man, it'd be neat to write a song like this, write a song like that. Like, I don't feel I'm at the point where all the songs are written. You know, I think there's still music inside of me that's got to come out and still I'm not going to force it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've been doing it for this long. Clearly I'm not in a hurry. And <laughs> to me, like, yeah, it'd be nice if I made a little bit more money than I do doing this a little bit more famous, but that's, I don't want that at the cost of, you know, my integrity, the music I want to write uh, or it becoming something that's not fun anymore. You know, kind of like we were talking closer to the start, like, I'm at that size where I can manage myself. I can fund myself, book myself. Mm -hmm. It's kind of me and and then Val uh, helps with the PR stuff. Of course, every promoter in the world helps me out tons putting on shows locally. You know, but at the same time, I, there's no one really on staff. And those people, you know, even when the show does well, like it's twisting arms to try to get them to take anything. Like a show goes great. They pay me like a couple hundred bucks and trying to give them free records. And they're still like trying to give me money for the records. Like, People are so nice, and it's not yeah. only me doing that. I I want to make sure it's acknowledged that everyone who books me helps me out huge, and they're a huge part of it. At the same time, in terms of people on staff, it's only me. And so I think I'm very, very lucky in the sense that there's no pressure to do this or to do that. Hey, write this record. Hey, this is popular. Hey, we brought in a songwriter. Here's your next album. Learn this. Like, you know, I've, 
that'll never be the case for me. And I, I, you know, when I, other people are kind of like rubbing two sticks together, trying to figure it out, like I can't necessarily put out a Zippo at the same time, you know, like, oh yeah, I think I have a pack of matches here somewhere. <laughs> like I, I have a clue of, of what kind of works for me. And, you know, after 25 years of, of doing it and struggling and, and it not being easy all the time, it's, it's been the greatest thing I've ever done. And, you know, the amount of people I've met and yeah, it's, it's hard to, hard to kind of pin it down on kind of one or even several reasons. There's so many reasons I do music and I absolutely love music. And uh, during the pandemic, um, I actually started a YouTube channel and I'm proud of it. It's not very big. I I don't uh, thank you. It was called far from regular. Oh, nice. and it was me, me doing a research on something. I would spend a week. So Monday would be my research script day. Tuesday, I would do me in the van because everywhere in my apartment was echoey. It didn't sound good. The van was the only place that kind of a vocal booth that I had access sure, to during yeah. the pandemic. So I'd record myself in the van reading the script. I'd cut it together on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then sometimes it spilled into the weekend was my like cutting the B roll into it. Yeah. And I loved doing it, you know, it, something like as a hobby, I wish I could still do it once in a while. I, I wish I had the time, but in terms of like the feeling I got when I put an episode up and like, oh shit, this one episode got a thousand views. Awesome. You know, like that kind of stuff. It yeah. wasn't the same feeling I got when I played to three people and they liked it. You know, like I played to three people and one person bought a record. Like it's such an accomplishing feeling to share your music with people and yeah. them to enjoy it. it you know, that feeling that I got when I put on, you know, that cassette tape back in the 90s, jump on the skateboard, go into work. And if it, you know, if it got pumped up or if the lyrics were maybe about something like this person lost someone in life and like I lost someone too. And now I, you know, someone has the same feelings as me. It helps me get out of that. Like there's, there's so many reasons and I hope I've covered most of them. In no. that rant. no, that was great. Uh, much kudos. You know, I, I, I think for me, it's like, very i imagine very similarly it's like the the sense of community i think that's kind of what draw draw me in like i didn't felt like i felt fit in with anybody else you know but the alternative space welcomed me regardless of you know whatever i'm wherever i was from you know i think that's kind of what i why i do this and why i owe a lot to the the bands and why I choose to just continue to do it and I'll keep doing it until the wheels fall off. You know, I think to me, it's like, it's always made a profound impact on my life. And I hope that people that watch any of these videos or check out the artists or whatever, I hope that they make an impact on you because I think that's like, to me, that's like the most crucial thing is like, if somebody walks away and they're like, I've never heard of Greg, I'm going to go check out his stuff. And then they're like, you know, Greg's going to come tour my state or my city or my country. I'm going to go out and see him. Like that to me is like more valuable to me than if I make money doing this or if I, whatever, you know, or if I reach a certain level of like accolades or, you know, people, whatever. I think music has, you know, music has spoken to me on, you know, I guess kind of a spiritual-ish level, you know, and I think that I would love to be able to share that that level of connectness that i felt in the scene and still feel and i would like to be able to share that experience with other people so that they can feel like they're welcomed and that they're a part of this just as much as i am you know even though i interview bands and you know i I have been doing it for a long time you know to me it's like i'm gonna continue on that mode and and you know, I appreciate the time that you have spent with me, Greg, and obviously the 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 insight you have given. You know, obviously, kudos to the next twenty five years if you do continue to do it for twenty five years. If not, you know, even still, kudos for the longevity and continuing to do it uh, is some really great stuff. So perfect segue into the last thing, Greg. Tell them where they can find you at. What you have coming up? Because I I think you got a lot coming up, if I'm not mistaken, or Val told me wrong, but I think you got a lot. Of no, stuff no, <laughs> he told you right. Yeah. So I, obviously online, um, I'm on the Spotify's and the Apple Music's and all the other platforms that you could stream on. Uh, I work with this company called CD Baby. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they're they're great at getting you on everything. So if if you search me out, you will find me. 
Uh, if you want to buy a digital copy of the record, Bandcamp is the best one that I like to use. Um, Sinners Go to Church, Saints Go to Jail, that's the new record. So please, please check it out. And, uh, and yeah, I'm doing a massive tour. The dates will be posted very soon. Um, until I get across that border into the USA, I don't, I never, I always <laughs> am scared. But even though I have a P2 work visa, it's not like I'm doing anything wrong. I'm always worried to post stuff online too much because border yeah. guards, you know, border guards be mean sometimes. But uh, if you check it out in about a week's time, all the dates will be posted up. I'll be doing Midwest, East Coast stuff. I'm in Quebec and then I'm in Europe for two months. Fall time, I do a giant tour all around North America. Like I said, I do 150 shows a year. So the chances that I'm coming close to you is a very good, good chance. I'm easy to find online. So please, please reach out, you know, email me, write me on, on Bookface on Instagram. Tell me what you think. Tell me, you know, if you want me to come play near you, let me know where you are. I'd love the chance. And you know, music makes the world go around, man. Let's keep it that way. I don't know if it'll come to Brazil, the guys, though. That, that, that might take a little bit more. That was a, for all you touring bands, you know I'm talking about. That's a joke. Because every band gets a comment, come to Brazil. And I'm sure there are people in Brazil that like Greg. So if you do want to make it happen, do type come to Brazil because that would be hilarious. Yeah, right. But but also I'll learn some Portuguese. <laughs> he'll yeah, Greg will learn some Portuguese. I I won't because I'm not going to Brazil. But if I was, I would try to learn Portuguese. So if you want to go awesome. support Greg, I'll leave all the links down in the description. Go check him out. I'll also leave a link to his YouTube channel if I can go find it. I'll I'll just ask him to send it to me. So then I'll leave that link below. Go give him a follow on Spotify. I've already done it already. So I know when Greg releases stuff. So if you want to be in the know, go do that. I know I've given her plenty of shout outs and she probably deserves more than this. But Val, again, major salutes to Val. I love Val. She's yeah, Val. Big, big salutes. And uh, if you enjoyed this interview, Share, like, and subscribe. It goes a long way. Uh, I love doing this. So big shout-outs to Greg for coming on and, and chatting with me tonight. Thanks so much for having me, Brandon. It was awesome.